Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 18th edition of the Coffee Microcaps Morning Meeting. Uh, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps. For anybody who hasn't joined us in one of the previous events or been to one of our in-person conferences, even though that was quite a while ago now, I'm just going to quickly run through some uh, housekeeping slides and then we're going to get straight into it with our first presenter this morning. Uh, so the structure of the webinar for anybody who hasn't joined us before, they generally run every fortnight and we run it over an hour, 30 minutes for each company. We kind of break that down into a 20 minute prezzo and 10 minutes of Q&A. If you have any qu questions for the presenters, please type them in the Q&A box uh, rather than the chat function. And then I'll moderate the questions to our presenters at the, at the end of their presentation. And um, please note that the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel uh, either later today or probably most likely tomorrow. So if we run over a slide quickly or you want to watch back uh, the presentation, you can do it there or alternatively you can look back at some of the, the previous uh, editions of, the, of this series. Uh, where you can follow Coffee Microcaps, we're on Twitter, as I said, YouTube for recordings of all the webinars and we've got a couple of fund manager uh, interviews as well which we just recently started doing linkedin for some additional long form content i also write a weekly paid newsletter which can be accessed from the coffee microcaps substack platform uh, our first presenter this morning is going to be mr adam brimo co-founder and group CEO of Open Learning. After Adam, then we're going to cut straight to Mr. Lee Martin Seymour, the CEO and co-founder of Xref. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to Adam, our first presenter. Uh, I can see your cover slide now, Adam, so you're ready to go. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for your time today. Really appreciate it. Um, so this morning, I'll briefly run through the latest investor presentation that we have out in the market. Um, and, you know, I'll try and do that as quickly as possible to leave as much time as we can for, for Q&A. Um, so my name is Adam. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Open Learning. And let me just uh, get started here. So Open Learning is a leader in the online education sector. Now, just for a bit of background, uh, I founded the company in 2012 with a former, I guess, colleague and classmate of the University of New South Wales, um, a professor by the name of Richard Buckland, and my co-founder and CTO, David Collian, who is doing a PhD in online learning communities. And really what we've done is we've built an all-in-one solution that enables education providers to move online. It enables them to increase engagement amongst their existing students, it enables them to deliver programs to new students, and it does so in a way that is, you know, anchored on um, very strong research-backed uh, sort of pedagogy or, or learning sciences, as it's called. <clears throat> so the key components of our offering are a global learning platform, which is a scalable cloud platform, which has all the functionality for delivering anything from a short course, a micro-credential through to an online degree, entirely online. Uh, you can think of it almost as a turnkey online uh, college or university platform uh, in the sense that through open learning we can launch what we call an institution or a portal um, that has that's like a mini website for the, uh, the university or college in that they can have all of their courses and then the learning platform itself is part of that so people can actually go on to the platform enroll in the course pay for a course uh, the course is delivered entirely on open learning um, by the education provider. It has open learning has all the tools for uh, you know delivery, activity-based learning, project-based learning, collaboration, um, assessment, certification, and micro credentials. So it's really an end-to-end -end platform. We at the moment we have everything from short online courses, maybe take one hour to complete, through to entire uh, multi-year master's degrees running 100% uh, on the platform. Uh, linked to that, we have what we call the Open Learning Marketplace, which is what you see when you go to openlearning.com. And that's really a collection of showcase courses that are running on Open Learning. Uh, all these courses go through a quality assurance process, and the courses listed there are ones that are designed for the public. So it's actually only about 5% of the courses running on Open Learning. 
because a lot of the universities and, and providers we work with are, are actually running their courses for a private group of students or people uh, rather than the public. <clears throat> so, so that's only a subset of what's running on the platform. The next element is the portfolios. So every person who goes through a course on open learning will actually have an automatically generated portfolio. And this portfolio captures all of the evidence of learning. So every time somebody does a project, they collaborate on an activity, um, they're working with people to solve a problem, all of the evidence, the artifacts we call it, uh, go into their portfolio. And then um, both, uh, I guess, institutions like universities and colleges, but also potential employers can actually um, access that portfolio if the student allows it and uh, you know, uh, see if maybe it'll help them get a job and things like that, so the different outcomes. And the next component of our offering is what we call open creds, which is a micro-credentialing framework that we've developed ourselves um, this year. And micro-credentials are a growing um, you know, part of the education sector. So just for a bit of background, um, you know, micro-credentials have been around for some time. Effectively, they're like you know, very short online courses that might lead towards credit. But uh, open creds is a framework that we've designed to standardize that. So it specifies how long a course should be, uh, whether it leads towards credit, uh, who can offer it, you know, how big it is. Um, and you know, we, we own that framework and we've launched it in Australia and it's aligned to the Australian qualifications uh, framework and system. So open learning is now one of the largest online education platforms in the world. We have about 2.6 million users on the platform, about 143 education providers. And we're primarily focused on Australia and Southeast Asia. Our largest competitors are Coursera in the US and FutureLearn in the UK. And um, these are platforms that allow uh, institutions to also run online courses and degree programs. Um, what makes this category different to, let's say, a learning management system or another enterprise system a university might use is that all of these uh, platforms here, including open learning, are designed as sort of a modern cloud application. Um, you know, everyone, every institution around the world is on the same instance of open learning. Every student, no matter which university they're coming from, has an open learning account, um, and, and they see the open learning logo, and they have, um, you know, a, a relationship. The end customer has a relationship with us directly. That's different to, let's say, a learning management system, where a university sort of buys it, installs it on their server, or pays someone else to run it in the cloud for them. And uh, in that model, you know, everything is sort of uh, managed by the university, and the student's account is, isn't transportable. Um, so this is advantageous because it means we have both the learning delivery platform, but also uh, a marketing capability to the users on the platform who opt in um, to our uh, sort of newsletters and things like that. So recently, you know, we, we work with a lot of institutions um, around the world and our key markets are Australia and Malaysia. So I just want to highlight one of the uh, transformative partnerships we've recently done uh, in Australia. And this is with UNSW Global. And this partnership is to deliver an online pathway program. Now, pathway programs are uh, effectively uh, short programs sort of falling between year 12 and the entrance of, into university. And they're designed for people who just miss out on the entry requirements for getting into the university of their choice. So it might be that you know, a student wants to study commerce at UNSW, but they, you know, they're one level or a few marks below where they need to be for science or English or mathematics or, or any subject like that. So the pathway programs are designed to bridge that gap. Now, the largest pathway provider in Australia would be Navitas, but many universities also offer their own pathway programs um, without, um, you know, independently. So UNSW Global is actually the leader in pathway programs in Australia. Um, in fact, they, I think, are probably the first university well before Navitas to actually offer pathway programs. So they're very highly regarded um, in the space. And this is the first time they've partnered with an external company to deliver the program. Now, we've worked with UNSW for about seven years now. And um, we started working with this division inside UNSW earlier this year um, as COVID hit. And we've worked with them to move some of their English um, language courses online. And the results have been fantastic. Uh, students overseas who couldn't make it here, not only were you know, happy that they could do the course online, but they actually really enjoyed the experience. The engagement was far higher than um, many other online courses that are running at this year. Uh, satisfaction was way up as well. 
So from there, we moved into what, you know, thinking about what's next. And um, we've come with the, uh, you know, this partnership where we're delivering one of their key uh, pathway programs, which is called the transition program. And it's a four month long program. So students who just miss out on the entry requirements go into this program. It's like a very compressed year 12, covers math, English, science, um, uh, computing, a few other subjects as well. And students will go into this program, they'll complete it, they get a UNSW certificate, and then they can proceed to the university. Now, this program is currently run on campus. On campus, it sells for about $22,800, uh, tuition fees, not including room and board and travel. When we move it online, we're redesigning it so it's actually gonna be much more uh, engaging, a very different style of delivery. And it'll, it'll only cost about $16,000, um, just on that $15,960 is the sort of retail price. And um, we'll receive uh, between $6,000 and $9,000 for that program um, as it's on open learning. And for that, we're gonna be redesigning the program on the platform, uh, involved, we're involved in the delivery of it. Uh, UNSW Global is actually the, going to be marketing it though. So they're, they're already out there uh, promoting this um, around the world. So this is a very large market. Uh, and this deal for us is, is actually quite transformative. Um, as you'll see, there's sort of three parts to our model. There's sort of the software as a service component. We have open creds, and now this is a new area, qualifications, we call it, uh, where we receive a share of the revenue that's um, you know, from the, the programs and courses being delivered on the platform. Uh, we see this being a very large opportunity. Um, we can't disclose what our estimates are for the program itself, but there are thousands and thousands of hundreds of thousands of international students coming into Australia every year. Um, a good portion of those have to go through some kind of pathway program. This is a very specialized pathway program. Most pathways are uh, one year. Um, this is four months. So we think actually it'll be very appealing. Uh, and it's already been running for 15 years on campus um, with uh, pretty solid results. So in the micro-credentialing space, open learning is effectively creating and leading um, the new micro-credential market. And our approach has been not just to provide the platform, but also to work out how we can really differentiate ourselves. And that's, that comes down to not just the platform and the approach we have, but also the ecosystem we build around it. And Open Creds is really driving that. So Open Creds is a cross-sector framework. It's the first uh, cross-sector micro-credential framework in Australia, aligned to the Australian qualifications uh, framework itself. And it specifies that a micro-credential should be anywhere from two and a half hours through to 150 hours. So that's like everything from a short professional development course all the way through to a single course inside a master's degree. And the idea is um, you can build courses of different sizes, you can stack them up and then eventually get credit if you want to. Now to drive adoption of this, what we've done initially is focus on the supply side of the market. So building up the library of open creds. Now to do that, we've launched two things. One is um, we've signed a number of agreements with Open Universities Australia which is the largest higher education provider in the country with 21 university partners, about 440,000 alumni. And they've selected Open Learning as their micro-credential platform. Now we're also with them jointly developing 30 open creds on a revenue share basis with um, universities around the country. Uh, second is we've launched the Open Creds Investment Fund, which um, is a fund that we've set up with about $350,000. And that will fund the development um, of at least 35 uh, open creds, but probably a lot more. Um, we've already signed eight higher education providers and built 26, and we're building 26 open creds um, under that model. And uh, just in the past um, couple of months, we've launched open creds in Malaysia as well, which is the other large market. And that's um, tailored to the Malaysian market. So, you know, what we're effectively doing is creating a new category um, of qualification in people's minds, um, open creds. And because we control that, open creds have to be run on open learning, and we can manage the quality assurance and control process. Um, so we have a number of clients all around the world. Uh, in Australia, we work with about um, nine universities and um, in Malaysia, we work with many as well. So we've got 143 clients globally across higher education, universities, vocational and industry associations. Um, so really what's driving this is skills shortages and technological change um, are leading to greater demand for education around the world. Uh, these stats are actually from before COVID. Um, so effectively what we're seeing is that a large number of people need to be reskilled and upskilled and that's driving demand both for university education as a whole, um, but also for these short courses and micro-credentials, which are designed to fill some of these skills gaps. 
Now, what makes open learning really different, I guess, from a technology perspective, is that we've actually built the technology around a proven educational uh, approach, learning sciences approach. And that's, um, you know, I think it is actually quite unique. There are very few platforms that, that are built in this way because usually there's not much overlap between the technologist and the educator, but um, open learning is effectively founded by educators and engineers. So open learning is built around this approach called social constructivism, which you can look up on our website. Uh, but effectively what it means is project-based learning, active learning, collaboration, problem solving. So most online courses, you know, outside of open learning are videos and quizzes and PowerPoint slides. And they're just, you know, very boring. They don't deliver the outcomes. Uh, we put them in the e-learning 1.0 category. Open learning is really up the top. Um, we're, we've got a very experienced board of directors. So um, Kevin Barry is our chairman. He's also chairman of ICS Global, uh, runs TCAP uh, in Australia. Uh, Spiro Papas is the executive director and senior advisor. Um, he's also the chairman of Split It, has been at NAB for quite some time. Uh, prior to that, Maya Hari, who's the vice president uh, of uh, Asia Pacific at Twitter, uh, based in Singapore. Um, we've also got David Buckingham, the ex-CEO of Navitas, who really understands the education um, sector extremely well. And same with Beverly Oliver. She's probably the foremost leader in micro-credentials in Australia. And she was a former deputy vice chancellor at Deakin University. Um, so I'm really, you know, really honored to be supported by such a fantastic board. Um, our management team as well, uh, David Cullion, um, my co-founder and CTO, he's, uh, you know, got great experience both in the education space, but also one of the most brilliant computer scientists. Um, Shri Diaz, who's our managing director of Australia, um, formerly from uh, study group and the ICD. Uh, Sarveen, who runs our Malaysian business, um, is formerly, um, you know, in, in investment banking. Um, and he actually set up a, uh, I think a hedge fund at one point as well. So, um, but he moved into the education sector with us. And what our CFO used to be the uh, CFO of Parkson uh, Retail, which was listed on the Singapore Stock Exchange. So a really fantastic management team. So this is just from a, a recent uh, capital raising we did. Uh, we raised $6 million um, fairly quickly, about a month and a half ago. And, you know, that's really going to fund the next level of growth. Uh, in particular, these programs that we're building with UNSW Global, where we're investing upfront, um, and that's a five-year agreement. So we expect to get uh, revenue over the next five years as that program ramps up from students. And as international students come back into the country, we expect demand for that program to increase as well. Uh, we're also allocating some additional funding to open creds, so we can really drive that, um, that framework and make sure it becomes the standard for the country. Um, and we're also obviously expanding our sales and marketing platform and exploring a few other opportunities as well. So the company is now very well funded. Um, we've got a lot of flexibility in, in what we do um, and we're evaluating you know, opportunities as they come. So the, the three parts to our model, there's the software as a service, um, there's our services, which is you know, learning design and professional services we offer around the platform. Uh, and then we also have our qualifications, which we're just starting now. So on the software as a service side, our annualized recurring revenue um, as at the end of uh, September was 1.225 million. Um, that's a growth of about 55% year on year. Our gross margin has increased. Um, our number of clients has increased much faster by 160%. And this is because when institutions start off with open learning, they actually start off on a usage-based uh, plan. So they usually start off on the lowest plan or one of the lower plans that we offer. Uh, and then as the usage grows, their um, the revenue we get from them grows. So seeing customer numbers grow is, is a very good indicator of uh, future growth. Uh, enrollments and, and registered users have also grown significantly. Now, just for some context, we only actually turned on the software as a service model um, a couple of years ago. Prior to that, we actually allowed anyone to use the platform for free to build traction and grow the user base. So as I was mentioning before, under our sort of platform SaaS and services model, we average about $20 per user per year in revenue in Australia. Under open creds, because there's a revenue share component, we probably average around $75. Um, and we're helping to you know, fund the development of some of those courses. But where we get involved in qualifications like UNSW Global, that's where we can capture you know, more than $500 per user. In the case of um, the UNSW Global program, uh, $6,000 to $9,000 uh, per user because of all the work that we're doing um, to, to, bring that, to run that program as well. Uh, so really what we're focused on is, you know, automating and driving the platform SaaS and services, because that's really scalable and high volume, and then picking selected programs and qualifications to deliver on a revenue share uh, basis. And we've seen that 
both in the SaaS and services side and also on the revenue share side. Um, once programs get going, uh, you know, their, their usage increases and our revenue will increase from that as well. Um, so just a few more uh, stats here. So we've got clients from 12 countries, um, about 56% of our clients are in Australia. Um, you know, the average revenue per client is about sort of eight and a half thousand. Um, that average has declined a bit as we've brought on a lot of new clients who've started on lower price plans. Um, and, you know, they've been quite grateful of that due to COVID and we expect that their usage will ramp up over time. Um, enrollment and, and uh, user numbers have grown significantly uh, over the past few months as well. Um, so with 2.6 million registered learners and 4.2 million enrollments, what that means is people are doing more than one course on the platform. That could be an institution running more than one course or someone coming back for more than one course. Um, and this is just from uh, the first half of the year. Um, so we are, we're on a calendar year basis, this is the 30 June. So um, you can see our so SaaS revenue has gone, gone up by about 81%. Um, our services slash marketplace components up by 40%. Uh, services is really just when we provide learning design to help people get their courses online. It's not um, you know, a core part of our model, really our focus is on platform SaaS and um, the qualifications and open creds are in the marketplace category. And those are just coming online sort of now and next year. So um, yeah, that's probably a space to watch. But yeah, that's pretty much it from me, but very happy to answer any questions now as well. Okay, that's great. And um, thanks. I have actually a couple of questions that were emailed into me ahead of time for somebody who couldn't join us this morning. Um, one was open learning's applicability in the corporate market. They're saying, for example, you know, somebody like B BHP doing their standard like OH and S um, programs across you know, their workforce or, or McDonald's doing, you know, induction training, you know, that constant recurring, but kind of quite uh, straightforward uh, learning and, and kind of accreditation that, that they need to do internally on a, on a yearly basis. Yeah, so we have corporate clients, but we're not really involved in compliance training. Um, compliance training, you know, we, we often think of as, um, quite boring and sort of a tick and flick. You know, uh, a lot of organizations are just trying to get that over with as quickly as possible. They're not really interested in the learning outcomes from that. So where we're involved in is more what we would consider professional development, where organizations are looking for a transformation in skills or behavior from um, their employees. And that's where we, we're more likely to get involved. Um, so for example, some of our, uh, I guess, non-education sector clients include um, a number of Australian government departments, uh, including the Australian Institute of Sport, which runs um, uh, training programs, professional development programs for all the high performance and Olympic athletes in Australia. Uh, we work with ASIC on delivering their teacher training programs. Um, so, and we also work with a number of other um, corporates I can't say as well in partnership with universities. So I guess, yeah, we get involved when there's actually a really high value education program. Uh, we don't typically get involved in sort of that really, uh, what's a lower value, um, much uh, simpler compliance training. Okay, and then another question they had was, is there any real major difference between you and Coursera or Future Learn in the UK um, in terms of the platform, or is it just they're big in that geography and, and you're big in the, the Australia slash Southeast Asia geography? Uh, yeah, there, there are very significant differences in the platform. So as I mentioned, open learning is built around this um, more social constructivist approach, which involves a lot of project-based learning, collaboration, uh, teamwork, and it really changes how you design the courses themselves. On uh, FutureLearn, they talk a lot about social learning, um, but the tools for that, uh, so open learning is, does social learning as well. It's a subset of, of social constructivism. Um, but it, on FutureLearn, it's quite a simple social learning approach. It's just really commenting and discussion. Um, on Coursera, it's much more based on video lectures and quizzes. Um, now, the reason why this matters is because universities in particular are looking at these platforms in one of two ways. They're seeing them either as purely a distribution channel or as a platform for delivering education where they see value in, in the delivery itself. Now with Coursera and FutureLearn, universities primarily see them as a marketing and distribution channel. Uh, they don't really value the platform too much because they think it's quite basic and rudimentary. Um, whereas with open learning, 
they are actually moving in the direction of social constructivism. A lot of universities in Australia have actually said that's the direction they're moving from the design perspective of their courses. And they see open learning as a very flexible platform for delivering you know, very complex types of courses. Like um, we have postgraduate courses in a whole range of areas that involve a lot of project-based learning and collaboration. So there's very significant differences in the platform itself. Um, the other element is, is sort of the business model. We have a very open business model. It's software as a service for these institutions um, and they can use the platform for whatever courses they want. They can decide whether the course is public or private um, and who can join. Whereas on Coursera and FutureLearn, uh, the universities lose that control. They lose control over pricing. They have to fit the platform's pricing model. They lose control over you know, how um, the, the structure of the course. You know, FutureLearn has to be a certain number of weeks long. Same with Coursera. Whereas for us, we're really flexible in how we operate. And then the, the final question, I'm not sure if you're aware of the Kajabi platform, but it was more about, could you open up open creds to people designing their own course, but that it fits into uh, you know, a micro qualification, but you, you know, you're really opening up for somebody who might be you know, a skilled digital marketer or a skilled um, accountant or somebody like that who can create their own little mini course and it, it, it goes on your platform and people can get a, a recognized qualification or open credit at the end of it. Yeah, so whether um, it's open to organizations or people who aren't education providers, is that the question? Yeah, yeah I guess if you if, if you wanted it to, if yeah, I yeah, yeah, you yeah. when I said I wanted to run a course, but I mightn't be, you know, UNSLW or, or, or a specific corporate client, but I, I think I could put together a very uh, practical based course for somebody who's going to operate in my industry, I think is what the question is trying yeah, to say. Yeah, yeah, you definitely can. And we have a lot of... Um, we, we call them uh, independent educators uh, okay. or people running courses personally. So when you go on open learning, you can actually go on and create a course. Um, we have software as a service plans for individuals or independent education providers. And um, yeah, they're able to use all the functionality of the platform. Uh, if they want to build open creds, there's three categories of open creds. There's higher education, vocational and professional learning. Um, they would fall into the professional learning category okay. because obviously they're not an accredited provider. Mm -hmm. but part of the idea of open creds is that um, institutions will be more likely to accept uh, professional learning courses for credit if they come as open creds because of the structure of open creds. So it means that the institution knows that the course has learning outcomes that are clearly defined. They know how much learning time was involved. They have a portfolio to look through. So it optimizes the process. So yeah, individuals are able to leverage that as well. Great, yeah, that was the, all the email questions. And if we don't have any further questions from the audience, uh, we might finish a minute or two early because I know uh, Lee is patiently standing by to join us. Uh, okay, Adam, I think we'll, we'll leave it there. If you want to stop sharing your screen and then we can um, hand over to Lee. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate everyone's time and feel free to reach out if there's any other questions. Thank you, Adam. Lee, I can see the, the cover slide of your presentation <laughs> now, so you're, you're ready to go. I am here, thanks, Mark. And um, uh, thanks for having us on here this morning. It's a, it's a very good day for us at XREF because it's our 10 year anniversary so um, following this presentation I need to get my Christmas hat on and, uh, and and join the team as we have our Christmas party and our 10 year celebration today so um, so it's a good day and no one can upset me today so it's good um, so um, hopefully a lot of people that are joining us this morning already know of the XREF business um, our ticker is XF1 and we've been listed now for five years. So there's an absolute wealth of um, information on the market. However, if you don't know who we are, um, I'm gonna spin you through that pretty quickly. Um, if you want some more information, you can simply go to xf1.com. That was our 2000, late 2019 presentation. Um, we are due to um, bring a new presentation out in February because we've got lots to talk about. Um, but ultimately, through COVID, we have not um, updated um, too much of xf1.com. 
that is our investor presentation. So before you hire, check with XREF. What do we do? Um, bear with me. So <clears throat> we verify the who, what, and where of a candidate in one place. Um, now, what does that mean? Before somebody hires a candidate, um, they ultimately need to check at least their references. Reference checking is something that we automated 10 years to the day um, ago um, and um, have uh, been bringing on large uh, enterprise, medium-sized businesses, small businesses um, for the last 10 years who are just tired of the way that the world was uh, checking uh, uh, on a candidate before they hire them. Now, <clears throat> um, we, we are known for reference checking. We're known for automated reference checking and we automate everything in, in, on platform. There's no hamsters in wheels. There's no call centers. Um, everything happens uh, online. As well as that, we also, uh, we bought a business a year ago to handle ID checks. So we can do ID checks ourselves. Um, and on, on top of that, um, DVS um, uh, uh, checking on passports and driving licenses around the world. So um, we, can all, we can do that in-house and we integrate other people's checks around the world in terms of police working with children. So we are a reference checking platform with other checks um, uh, 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 stitched in. In terms of um, our business model, uh, we would sell, if we walked into a place like Telstra or Optus, if they were hiring a thousand people this year, we would simply sell them a thousand credits uh, to cover their thousand candidates. So one credit covers one candidate. The average credit is, a, is anywhere between 55 and $75, depending on what level of platform you're using from us. And we would receive that money um, up front before loading the credits onto their, onto their platform. As the client uses those credits to reference their staff, we recognize that revenue. So we receive cash up front and we recognize the revenue once those credits are taken. So if you have a relationship as a shareholder with XREF, you must understand that we have a sales figure and we have a usage figure. And for you guys, that means our sales is basically our cash collections and our usage is our revenue. Okay. So um, what do we look like at the moment? Well, uh, we're founded by myself and, and Tim Griffiths. Um, Tim has an IT background and I have a recruitment and HR background. So what you're seeing here is, is, is a, is a um, solution for an industry that uh, most of the XREF staff work in, um, built by, um, you know, this is, this is the baby that happens when uh, IT and the industry come together. We've been in business for 10 years. Uh, we've been listed for five uh, we were a private business before that. We took no investment up until the time that we listed. Um, we have 60 plus staff uh, across five uh, office locations globally. Um, and we are a true global business. So we have multi-language and GDPR and ISO 27001. We have 24-7 uh, support globally in multi-languages. So we are a true global uh, um, uh, platform. Why do we exist? We exist because we've seen so many news articles in and around the world uh, 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 when, when recruitment goes wrong. So um, it's, it's really easy and there are no excuses now to um, properly conduct references uh, on a candidate. You must know, you must understand where they've been, what they've done and who they are. Um, if you're not doing that, then you might end up in one of these news stories. And, and these news stories, you know, they, um, they, they are from some of the biggest companies um, that we know in Australia, and most of them are now actually our clients. Um, so how, how does, you know, how does the world feel about um, our last 10 years? Well, because the platform's so easy, you can reference in as little as 30 seconds the candidate that you're going, hire, going to hire. There is no excuses not to do it. And in fact, if you're not an XREF customer, you can pop over to xref.com, sign up for free, and take your first reference on your, on your first candidate um, for free. So you can get in the platform and find the, 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 the power of the platform uh, within 30 seconds, conduct your references, and you might then become a client. But don't trust, um, obviously, what we say. We've been around a while. So 
Um, there is a lot of information online that um, you uh, guys can uh, check us out on. One of them is G2. G2 is one of the largest um, uh, uh, refer uh, 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 platform checking um, reference sites around. If you were in North America or the UK or parts of Australia, you would certainly go to G2, find XREF and, and check out what people are saying about us. So this means an awful lot to us. Um, and as you can see, uh, we consistently um, uh, uh, win awards on, on G2 and our rating is, is, um, is very good. So make sure you check us out. Um, in terms of um, our growth since listing, uh, what you'll see on xf1.com um, is a nice sort of gradual uh, uh, set of data points over the first four years of listing. And, and this is what we're going to update in February. So we're pretty excited about um, bringing the COVID story into xf1.com presentation. Um, and you can see here the green dots and the green dots represent where um, candidates have been checked um, via XREF. And you can see as we move on to um, 2019, you can see that, um, you know, that we, we, we are, we are uh, uh, conquering, you know, conquering the planet um, and uh, you can see the hotspots. So if you imagine for a second, when you reference a candidate, their referees, if you're hiring them in Australia, their referees might not be in Australia. They might be in North America or the UK. And so that referee in that country gets an experience of the XREF platform and how fast and simple it is. Um, and then they may themselves want to use the platform to hire. So we've grown out of an organic demand um, from countries. We haven't landed in countries and started to propagate our services. We've literally re 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 uh, responded to the demand that's out there. And we, we're quite excited about updating this heat map yet again um, uh, in, in February. In terms of um, Q1 performance, so uh, we've yet, you know, this, this webinar is, uh, you know, we're weeks away from closing out Q2. Very excited about bringing those stats um, to you. But in terms of um, Q2, considering that, you know, we went through um, the, you know, the, the sort of, we, we're still going through the, um, the effects of COVID. Um, but our sales for Q1 was 2.4. The usage of credits, um, the, the amount of uh, uh, recognized revenue that we had uh, was 2.2. You'll find that sales always tracks ahead of usage because our sales grow and our usage grows. And so sales is always ahead of our usage figure. Um, we collected two and a half million dollars in cash. Um, two and a half million dollars. Why? Because we had a, a pretty good Q4. Uh, the June quarter was pretty good. So some of that cash um, uh, from sales in late Q4 were collected in the early part of Q1. We spent 2.8 million, uh, 2.85 million in, um, in, in Q1. And that included all of our um, audit costs, et cetera, et cetera, and annual report costs. Um, so we were pretty happy uh, with how close that was to our sales figure. And we are drawing closer and closer to break even. And I'll get to our cost structure a little bit uh, later in the presentation. Um, our business that we bought a year ago um, grew by 155% in Q1 and, um, and, in, and is absolutely stonking along. And I think this, is, this echoes what's going on in the market for us. Um, the you know the world has woken up to the fact that we absolutely need to know um, the person that is sitting within 1.5 meters of us we need to know who they are where they've been and what they've done um, on a human scale irrelevant of recruitment however um, this echoes into our industry and the, and all recruiters and hr professionals globally are now focused on who is getting in their lift shaft who is um you know, who is in their building, who's walking in their office and who they're hiring. And so um, ID checking is becoming far more prevalent in the HR space um, as, you know, it's, its origins come from obviously online telco, online gambling, opening bank accounts online. You absolutely need ID, whereas our industry within HR recruitment is, is fast adopting um, the method. Our North American business, uh, despite COVID, grew 34%, and I think it's certainly 
um, a key focus for us as we go into 2021. And in fact, our self-serve platform that released in November 2019 is, is, is helping our growth within North America and our um, lead flow in that region. Our usage grew 27%. I'm going to show you a little bit of usage in a second, um, but our climb back out of COVID was, um, was excellent. And all of the clients that, that, that weren't rec re recruiting in COVID um, uh, came back to us in Q1 and, um, and our usage is now um, peaking above pre-COVID levels. Um, so that's a really good story. And one of the, the, the really nice results um, out of the last year, we, we in, in, in Q2 uh, um, 2019, so the December quarter last year, our expenses were 5.2 in the quarter. And we started last December to restructure our costs and become far more leaner as a business um, and far more digital. Um, so I'll, I'll speak about that in a second. Um, but across the year, we've managed to scale our expenses back um, by half. This is actually now a little bit more than 48%. So we've halved our costs, but we've grown as a business. So we've really had our cake and eat it this year, and it's been excellent. So if you can see here, this is our usage. The, these are, um, this is the amount of, in, val in dollar value, um, how many credits our clients are using. We've got about 10,000 users, and, and, and those users... Uh, are, are within about 1,000 or 1,100 um, accounts globally. Um, so at the beginning of COVID, we really wanted to measure uh, what was happening with our usage figure. And so we divided very quickly all of our accounts uh, into two very distinct groups, one non-essential and the other essential. When I'm talking about non-essential, I'm speaking about retail, hospitality, travel and tourism, the industries that would just drop like hotcakes um, at the beginning of, of COVID and, and throughout. Whereas essential services like um, aged care, healthcare, education, not-for-profit, government, these are um, uh, accounts that we have um, grown over the last um, uh, nine years leading into COVID and really provided a solid foundation of sales, new business sales and usage during um, the COVID um, pandemic from March. Initially, we were helping um, Kimberly Clark uh, with drivers to get toilet rolls into shopping centers. Um, <clears throat> then we were, uh, as people started to get sick, we were ramping up the hiring and checking of, of um, health workers in hospitals, etc. As, um, as people started to lose their jobs, uh, we worked with the government to find a thousand call centre workers to help people understand the job seeker and job keeper um, allowances for business and businesses and individuals. Um, moving on from that, uh, we, we then helped the not for profits um, hire case workers to help people that were going through um, a, a little bit of um, um, uh, uh, a bit of a, a mental um, health issues. Um, and, and funnily enough, as we pull out of the, the COVID hotspot, um, we are now uh, helping Department of Justice in three states uh, with caseworkers for petty crime because petty crime has been on the, um, on the rise. So we've seen so many different um, shades of, of, of essential businesses um, demanding the use of the XREF platform. But what's actually quite nice is the non-essential clients that we have like Crown Casinos, Qantas. Um, we've seen these, you know, the Westpac Bank, we've seen these clients pull back off their hiring. But as soon as they are, uh, as soon as we got past sort of, sort of May, June hotspot, we saw them recruiting again. Um, and they've come um, uh, screaming back onto the platform and and have um, topped up their credits. So um, our rebound in Q1 from the COVID pandemic has been exceptional. And, and uh, again, we're very excited to release the Q2 figures and show um, a very beautiful U-curve. In terms of our survival story, I think, I think on an individual level, um, we should all have a survival story from COVID, but XREF survival story is pretty pretty good and recently we had a wrap up with all of our staff in one room uh, where we where we spoke about the silver linings from what we've just gone through 
um, and I think it's added to the, um, the, you know, the excitement within our business right now. Through the last year, we, we are now closer to break even, um, and, um, and, and uh, I think Q, Q2 will obviously strengthen um, that uh, again. Um, our client retention, for 10 years, we have had sales teams pounding the pavement, smashing the phones, telling the world that the way they check candidates pre-employment is just not good enough, and they should be using um, uh, uh, XREF uh, to make to protect their their business from things like privacy, discrimination, and fraud. Within the pandemic, we have seen um, a an absolute demand for our platform, and um, we've seen we've seen our business um, be able to sustain uh, one of the biggest um, drops in recruitment. Uh, in, in our history, um, but so so what this has done for us is um, it's it's defined us as business critical. We're not a nice to have. Um, we are absolutely business critical. And as six hundred million workers return to work, and um, current workers start looking for new roles, um, twenty twenty one is is a very exciting prospect for us. Um, we've been able to every single month bring on new business. We released um, in October or late September, we released that um, we had bring, brought on um, three major um, billion dollar plus uh, entities in the US, the Middle East and Australia. So if you haven't seen that, please get onto our news and, and have a look at those huge client wins um, and, as well as many others during um, the, the pandemic. We are really good at remote working. I think COVID has shown us that we can be even more productive um, than being in the office. In fact, we had three suites um, down at Hickson Road in the Rocks, um, and we were spending about half a million dollars a year on those three suites. Um, all of them had different lease terms on them. And so what we've managed to do is redefine how we work at XREF. We've managed to um, uh, let two of those suites go and reduce that rental to about 150 grand a year. And we've built what we now call the XREF hub, which is a mix of meeting spaces, a lounge, a captain's table, and some hot desks, you know, a kitchen and a balcony. And it's a, it's a beautiful space, but because of our ability to uh, be far more productive working from home and, and a mix of in the hub and at home, um, we've just embraced remote working around the world and, and it's reflected in our cost structure. During COVID, we've re we're really good at listening to our clients and our clients have really determined what they look for in the future. And so we've listened and we have at the moment one of our biggest development um, uh, projects on in our history. And, and early part of next year, we're going to be responding to what happened in COVID with some really nice new product that takes what we do and expands it through the um, life cycle of a candidate all the way through from hire to retire. Um, so <clears throat> watch this space because as we come out um, uh, of the Christmas period into February, um, we'll be talking an awful lot more about development roadmap. We've really defined our market focus. So we are so good in the trust economy, in, in, in the community that you all live, you would trust your police officers and you would trust your government workers and your health workers. And if you're putting your kids into daycare or your, um, or, or your grandparents into aged care, you must be able to trust the people that are looking after them when you're not around. These areas are things that we do really well. When you're hiring someone in a trust environment, um, you must absolutely check ID, conduct their references, and then if you need to, add additional checks. And you can do all that in a heartbeat on our platform. So there's really no excuses for these things to go wrong anymore. But what it's done is meant that we can, um, as part of our future pandemic proofing, we can make sure that our foundation in essential businesses is, is far greater. Our cash balance went up by 5 million during June as we brought in a little bit of equity debt. Um, and I think um, we, we, you know, we, that was an awful long process to, to make sure that we got that right. But I think as we break even to, to attract a bit of a debt at a market premium was an intelligent move because at the time during COVID, 
um, we, we just didn't want to in, attract any of that dilution by, by raising or not raising within, within, within a, a bit of a poor market. So our cash balance went up and we did that in, in sort of the late part of Q4 um, purely because no one really knew or could be certain of whether we were going to survive um, uh, you know, uh, the COVID pandemic and, and how quick we, we would come out of it. So um, we just um, battened down the hatches and made sure that uh, we could get through another year of chaos if, if that happened. We've made further integrations. We've never stopped developing through, um, through, the, um, through the pandemic and we've made incredible integrations within products around the world. I'll speak about those in a second. Um, we certainly have defined our regional priority. We actually closed our Norwegian business and pushed all of our client, Norwegian clients and European clients into our UK um, business. And we focused um, on uh, North America and, and Europe as a whole. Um, and, and we've changed very um, quickly over the last sort of 18 months, two years from a very feet on the ground sales, direct sales business um, to a marketing led demand. And, and this has been really, really good for us. The world has woken up to the fact that human verification can be automated and can be um, um, far more um, beneficial online. Um, so, so they now understand what automated referencing is, which has allowed us to then go out and market um, digitally and bring leads in online through SEO, et cetera. So we've never wanted to be um, an army of salespeople um, we are now a collection of an incredible uh, account uh, executives and, um, and, and account managers uh, that work in the very, the very much the, the tier one space. Um, but we bring those leads on uh, at the sort of tier, tier, tier um, what, two to two, uh, one to two um, uh, direct and, and that three to four, that small business and medium business comes digitally through us uh, on self sign up. Um, we've we've also brought in an awful lot more data insight uh, during COVID, and I'm sure amongst other platforms, we'll be releasing some um, some further insights on on how um, the talent market is shifting uh, into 2021. And <clears throat> because we've uh, we want to be a, a, a much leaner business, and, and we are very much leaner than we were this time last year we've built an awful lot more self-serve on our platform. So clients can do an awful lot more um, uh, themselves than they could previously. In terms of break even, um, we have been reducing our costs uh, over, since, since last December. Um, and that's a mix of uh, not having to do events, uh, not traveling, reducing our, our footprint on um, real estate uh, leases, uh, reducing our, the headcount that we just simply don't need as we turn into a marketing-led business and so we are very close to that um, that break even and um, you know unfortunately if this webinar was in the early part of Jan we could we could talk about where we are with that but but watch this space so in terms of resources and and I'm right on time now but um, in terms of resources I urge you to pop over to xref.com you can actually try our um, product for free and spin the wheels. You do have to have a work email, but there is a video to tell you how our platform works. We have um, a template builder that's free for the industry globally. It's in multi-language, as you can see here. If you are referencing someone and you don't want to use Xref, you can at least build your own, plat your, your own template using template builder, but this gives you an idea of how bloody good our tech is. Um, in terms of our integrations, we integrate our services with some of the biggest platforms in the world. You can see here some local ones like JobAdder. You can see big ones like Oracle, Smart Recruiters, um, Workday. So have a look at our integrations page. Our um, success stories are, are, are on our um, website, you can see that they are absolutely stuffed with testimonials um, and videos from some of the biggest companies um, across the world. Our XREF um, uh, YouTube channel is full of um, help guides and uh, product guides as well as customer stories. G2 uh, again is full of uh, references that you can have a look at so please do your homework. We are a reference company so we'd expect you to reference us um, and at the very least just google us and have a look around. If you google us at xref you'll find us and you'll also find our 432 4.6 star reviews on google. So please do your own homework. 
um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Hopefully that was um, helpful. Uh, feel free to send us some uh, 10 year best wishes today. Have we got any questions, Mark? Uh, yeah, we've got a, a couple. Um, what percentage of customers are able to implement Dexref by themselves, like Air Wallachs mentioned in the in the recent announcement? Yeah, so um, Air Wallachs uh, signed up themselves on Xref Lite, so they pretty much um, went to our sign up page, um, uh, configured their Xref product, uh, they used their first uh, free credits. And then after that, they've been just been consistently buying with their credit card online. We've got in, in touch with them and we said, do you need any help? Do you need any whistles and bells? Do you want to integrate it with their ATS? And they said, no, it's exactly what we need. And we are absolutely fine and we love it. Um, so uh, you, you can give it a go if you want. Um, but if you want additional security, if you want um, to integrate to an ATS, if you want some, some extra whistles and bells, then we can pick you up um, at our key account level and, um, and, and make sure through our customer success team uh, that we um, expand your business. We're, we're very good at landing and expanding. So our, our, we land digitally, but it, we expand um, through our customer success team. And then another question, one was actually emailed in ahead of time. Um, can you give an update on where the CV1 um, partnership is? Uh, I know the phase one went live just before kind of the whole COVID storm hit, but, but where are you with the, the CV1 guys in that partnership? I think um, through COVID, it's been really good to not only stay close to your partners, um, but it's also really good to, uh, sorry, stay close to your ATS partners, but it's really, it's been really good to stay close to Rob. You know, um, <clears throat> Rob Sherwood, the CEO over there, we spend a lot of time talking to Rob. Um, CV1 listed at the similar time as us. Um, they've gone through uh, as many sort of twists and turns as we have. We share an awful lot of stories. We share a lot of clients. Um, you can get CV1 within XREF and you can get XREF within CV1, uh, CV Check. And um, we have revenue flowing. We have revenue flowing both ways. And I think Australia uh, or the Asia Pac um, air, uh, region was crying out for one platform to do everything. And um, Rod and I sat down and said, wouldn't it be good for both of us to give the region utopia? and not expect them to use CV check in XREF, um, but to just make sure they use us both in either of our platforms. So the partnership is going really well. I think we've, we've, we've made sure that we've um, communicated and had a few Zoom wines um, on the way through the pandemic. Um, but much like us, you know, they are busy, we are busy, and where we can, we can stitch a client together in either our platform or theirs. Um, and so it's yeah it's a it's a it's a really good partnership and very harmonious. And the second part to that question is there potential for similar partnerships in other geographic markets? Well, we already integrate with a company called UCheck in the UK and Checker in the US. And so in certain regions, because police checks obviously go, um, re, uh, the police checks are, um, originate in the local government database, you tend to get local providers for police checks, but where we can use CV check for overseas checks, we will do. Um, uh, and if we can't get those checks through CV check globally, then, then, we, then, we can, then we can integrate the other partners like check or you check. Okay, great. If there's no more questions from the audience, uh, we're just coming up exactly on the hour. So I'll we nailed it, we nailed it. <laughs> Uh, so uh, thank you for both of our presenters for, for, for staying on time. Okay, we don't have any more. Lee, I'm going to let you go. Thank you very much for taking the time. Thank Congratulations you. reaching uh, 10 years. As we all know, many of the stats of, I can't even remember what is, how many businesses don't even make it past uh, year one, year two, year three. So, I mean, it's a, it's a fair achievement to get to, to get to 10 years in any kind of small business publicly well, private these days well we've got great people so we're very fortunate we've got a lot to be thankful for okay um i'll leave it at that that's our last one for 2020 we'll be back on deck uh sometime mid to late january when 
Appendix 4Cs and Q1 updates, or sorry, Q2 updates uh, start hitting, hitting the market. And I look forward to um, XREF's Q2 updates sometime in, in, in mid-Jan. And I wish everybody a happy Christmas and a, hopefully a more normal 2021 for everyone.